run the graphics team after a while. I actually had my, my graphics person come in and she ripped it apart. The first one I sent you, yeah, then I showed it to her. I was really proud and she came in and said, she, she was really nice. And then the second, then that night, she sent me an email saying, when you got some time, I have some ideas. And she ripped off everything <laughs> apart. So that's why it changed. Okay, shall we get going? Sure. Okay, welcome. All right. Whoa. <laughs> All right, come on, come in, please. That's the uh, that's the title of this uh, session. If you're in the wrong one, stay anyway because we're paid by traffic. Um, I did. Uh, I, I have promised to make this short and entertaining, and I'm sure I can hit at least 50% of those metrics. So we'll start with the first um, thing, which is: so how many people were killed in D.C. last week? Now, if you read the Washington Post, which is I will stipulate a great newspaper. Um, they, they did a wonderful thing in, I think, uh, 2012, where they looked at uh, 11 years of homicides from, uh, I think, 2000 to 2011. They did a deep analysis. They had trends. They had maps. They had great visualizations. Uh, but they didn't tell you who got killed last week. To do that, you would go to Homicide Watch, uh, which does tell you what happened last week. Um, this is not the week. I took this slide from a, a, a bit uh, a little while ago. It says, you know, nobody no people were killed, it follows cases, it, um, it tells you how things have gone, and, and obviously there is a homicide watch in Chicago as well. Um, so how does this get done, um, but not at the post? So what homicide watch does is practice something that we call structured journalism that we want to talk about here today. Um, it's a different kind of journalism, um, uh, but it's very similar to uh, the journalism that I think gets practiced regularly. So that's what we're going to talk about, uh, just quickly who we are. Uh, I'm Reg, uh, I'm the guy behind Connected China. Um, uh, Bill um, is one of the co-founders of PolitiFact. Miguel is building Quadratopedia. Um, Laura is the person uh, who created um, uh, uh, Homicide Watch along with Chris, her husband. Say hi, Chris. Um, so all of, all of these sites practice what we call structured journalism. So what is it? Well, the first thing to say is a form of journalism. It, it has all the ideals of journalism, verification, public interest, helping readers, but it's structured. Um, and that means that we're taking the information and structuring it. It's not that different, but there are enough differences to make, it, uh, to make it work. The key thing, though, to note is that it coexists with, if you like, regular journalism. It complements it, it augments it, and it can improve it if done right. Um, so, what is Lots of things, it also cleans up your skin if you use it regularly. Um, so what is it exactly? So I want to take this through an example. So you have to have a, a, a reporter and she's working on a story and so she fills a notebook and maybe she's very diligent so she fills a couple of notebooks or maybe it's a really long-term project and there's a lot of notebooks. So you got all these notes. Now it's time to write the story and when it's time to write the story we do what all reporters do, we start sifting, right? There's some stuff that's a dead end so that goes away. There's some stuff that didn't fit for this story, so that goes away. And then there's stuff that just wasn't space for it in the story, so that goes away. And then once we've done that, we write the story. Now, it's a great story, it's a good story, it's well told, it's well read, it's up on the site, it's there for a day, it's there for a week, and then, you know, at some point it just goes into that bottomless pit we call the archive, where it can't be found, and even if it could be found, it's out of date, it's out of context. So let's rewind that for a second. That story had lots of information in it. It had dates, ages, amounts, relationships, all of that kind of stuff. If we extracted all of that, and then we extracted the information that was in the notebooks, not just in the notebooks that are left, but in all the notebooks, we took all of that, and we put it in a CMS or a database. And then if we had the same structure across the newsroom and we committed to filling it all out, we'd get lots of information in that. So then, when somebody comes and says, so how many people died, uh, were killed in DC last week? We take the information that's relevant and we can use it to start creating a story for them. 
right? So that gives us a story for that person. And if somebody else asks a slightly more quirky question, how many people were killed in the last 27 days, we can create that story. If somebody says, let's follow this case from start to finish, we can create another story. And of course, we don't have to just create stories. We can create not very good visualizations and graphics. Um, and of course, you can do this on any other topic, right? We can talk about education, we can talk about mapping power relationships, fact checking, and so on. You name it, and in fact, that's one of the reasons we want you in the room here, because we'd like you to name it. Um, so there's really two ideas here, right? The first one is don't throw shit away, right? That's, that's fairly obvious, but it's more than that. It's more than just sharing information in the newsroom. It's about committing to getting the information. It's committing to structuring it and then committing to reuse it. Because the second idea basically is um, pull, don't push. And the point here is that we tend to write news when we want it and we push it to people. And that's not really the model that, that readers or users want. They want information when they want it. And so the <coughs> idea here is to say we can create news or we can create information for people when they want it. So we can have reader-driven, on-demand news. Um, but what all this means is that we have to rethink what we do. And a couple of examples. Homicide Watch, as I've said, will let you follow a case all the way through, not just when something happens. PolitiFact can and does create a page on the fly that tells you, uh, in this case, uh, how the president is doing on telling the truth. No human had to do that story. That was you know, a, a, a machine-built story. At least I hope it was. And if it wasn't, uh, Bill will not correct me. Uh, Portopedia um, uh, lets you visualize relationships um, and keeps them up to date. And Connected China, because of the way it was built with a single database underpinning all of uh, the, uh, the, the facts built into it, can power multiple visualizations of Chinese power. So the summary basically is that daily reporting is obviously important and it's somewhat imperiled. Um, what structured journalism does is it builds on top of it. It, uh, it tries to cut down on waste. Um, it tries to cut down on dated information being published. And then it should increase the shelf life of what we do. It should make our stories up to date. Um, and it should give readers much more personalized information in terms of what they want, or at least information that they've asked for. Um, this is not necessarily easy, because we do have to rethink not just what we do, but how we do it. Um, and we'll make mistakes. We've made tons and tons of mistakes. But we are the people who are, we're the, really the craftspeople of information, right? We, we make the building box of information. We collect it. Um, this is all in our hands. We could do it if we wanted to do it. Um, we can and we should, I think, do this. We should try to restructure what we do, which is coincidentally the name of my blog. So if you want to read it, it's at the right at the bottom. And there's also a Google group, which Chris nicely <coughs> set up, which we would love you all to sign up for um, and, uh, and be a part of this community that we're trying to build. So I did promise it would be short, so it is short. And I'm going to turn over to the panel and start off with uh, a couple of softball questions that we've all planned in advance, uh, which is to go in order. So why, why do you do it? Why did the sites, why did the sites that you created practice this form of journalism? Well, first I want to thank a couple of people that are here in the audience that are going to be part of this conversation with us and have taken time out of their busy own schedules to be here. David Caswell, David Cohen, Craig Silverman, Melissa Bell, Jennifer Brandel. I feel like I'm at the Oscars. <laughs> um, Josh Stearns, Justin Farrell, John Keith, David Sumitra. Um, this is a small uh, but growing community of us who are looking for language to talk about these types of projects. Um, talking about Homicide Watch, talking about structured journalism in Chicago makes a lot of sense to me because this is a fabulous city for structure. If you have walked around at all, the River Walk, uh, Michigan Avenue, the Navy Pier, you're aware of the space that we're in, which is a beautiful space and an incredible space, and a space that asks something of you too. If you're on the River Walk, it asks that you take a moment, that you look at the river, that you perhaps slow down and stroll. Michigan Avenue asks that you maybe speed up to walk with the crowd, that you look up at the buildings, um, that you look into the shop windows. Um, this is what structure does. And when I think about the structure of Homicide Watch and the structure of journalism, I think about creating pathways just like this. 
and they're pathways that ask something of our users, of our readers, and of our communities. They ask them to participate in certain ways that benefit the community. We ask them to share in the space with us, just as you might ask someone to take a walk with you along the river or down Michigan <coughs> Avenue. Um, and this is what Homicide Watch does. The really important thing that I think it has taught me about creating that space is that it gives us the opportunity to invite people into it. And so structure for me is actually a very physical thing when I think about journalism. And the blank page that I start with is one that I begin not with thinking about a narrative or a story, but about an experience and with the people who are going to be sharing that space and how they're going to be interacting, where they're going to be looking, what they learn from looking at those things and what their pacing is through it, like I said, whether it's that quick walk um, or that lazy stroll. Um, and this is the structure that builds community um, in space, whether we are in real life um, in those places, Michigan Avenue, for example, or whether we're on Homicide Watch or PolitiFact. We're building that community in the space that we're occupying. Real? So, um in the case of PolitiFact, I guess uh, the message I want to leave you with, uh, at least initially, is that um, you don't need a huge staff to do any of this, um, that you can do structured journalism with a reporter, with half a reporter. Um, when we started PolitiFact, uh, when we built it um, appropriately, again, invoking Chicago, we were inspired by Adrian Hullavati, um and Matt Waite uh, and I as we came up with the structure. Matt was very much inspired by Adrian and we built it out and, and initially thought, man, we need a whole staff to do this. Matt's words were, you got a beast to feed here. And, um, but I think we've come to realize that the, the structure can be a supplement to a beat. So, uh, Reg put up the the page for Barack Obama, and indeed that's just generated on how many fact checks Barack Obama has had at this point, uh, several hundred, I think. And um, it's not like you need to dedicate uh, three people to this. Uh, you do need to build a. You do need to build something. Uh, you you need to build a, a structured site. But once you do that, this can, this can be a real supplement to the way that you cover anything, whether it's sports, whether it's politics, whether it's something else. Uh, I'm messing around with one at Duke where we're building a site to, uh, to do structured journalism on health coverage, on, the, on um, studies on health. So there's great potential here, and I hope you'll all think about it as you think about new ways you want to take your journalism ventures. Uh, and it's, it's not something where you've got to devote three or four people. Once you, once you get something built, you can do it with about half a person. There you go. Well, um, I want to answer with a question. How many people have been in deadline trying to figure out one thing, like this tiny little detail that you wrote about many times before and you don't find it because your news organization changed your CMS and the URLs are all messed up right now or uh, you lost it somewhere. Uh, that's how start, Polaropedia started as an idea. It's like this, we have this amazing way of tagging things that is very not useful for finding information and the fact, I come from always working in independent small news organizations, but the fact that in every newsroom that they're cutting down archive and documentation centers, um, and you have younger people that might not have such a, back, like a historical background, uh, we're only having stories that have the event and the context, but not the background, the historical background. So Poderopedia started just as a basic need in their newsroom to be like, I would love to save 30% of my time on pre-checking information that we already have there, uh, but we don't have it in a structured way and that is focused also in, the, in, in a more newsworthy aspect because we have Wikipedia, which is awesome. 
But Wikipedia is encyclopedic. It starts from like when you were born and to when you, you died, and not necessarily focuses on the bad things you've done, usually. And, and we like to map things about people, conflict, and power. That's how we try to understand how, how things are, and, and especially in countries like ours, the connections, like say somebody went to this high school, not even a university, this high school uh, means a lot uh, to where that person is in the food chain. So I just, I'm going to throw in my two cents on this. I, I, I came up thinking about this mostly because as I looked at newsrooms getting smaller and smaller and trying to think what is our competitive advantage, what do we have that you know, isn't going to get um, uh, swept away. And I needed to find a reason, frankly, to have a reasonable sized newsroom. And if you can get a newsroom together and do things, one of the things, we may not write the best story every day, in fact, we often don't, um, but what we do have, in theory at least, we have discipline. We show up for work, we, we cover the same beats, we collect information at a regular basis. If only we could do something with that beyond writing the stories. And so that's part of the reason I wanted to, to, to push this ahead. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit about the difficulties, because you know, we gotta, we, you've got to sell, but you've also got to be honest about the other part. So what are the challenges that you've faced in, um, in doing this? You want, Laura, you want to go? Sure. Um, for me, I, I think the big tension as Homicide Watch grew um, was and has been the tension between how specific we are in terms of this is a project specifically around homicides and not around any other type of crime or any other subject that a newsroom might cover. Um, with a desire to be more broad and to look for greater context and, and look for greater expansions. Early on, the questions started coming from both the community um, and editors and, and reporters. Homicides, yes, can you do this with uh, sexual assaults? Can you do this with education, for example? And you can, because uh, you can use the structured journalism approach. But yet, the products that we build to, to do this have to be structured specifically about what our community and user needs are which means that we have to be very specific in how we build them and the language that we use to create that structure. For homicides, for example, that's including a victim, name, age, race, gender in a database. Education, we don't talk about victims, so that's an entirely different database, an entirely different structure. Well, of course it is when you're thinking victims. about your audience, um, but it means that we are straddling that tension between between being very specific and then also being broad in order to accomplish um, as much as our community would desire. And David Caswell is here somewhere on, uh, who's working on something called Structured Stories, and you should talk to him about a broader thing that he's working on. Bill? A uh, big challenge, and we all know it, three letters that just strike fear in our hearts, CMS. <laughs> um, you know, the CMS is uh, always a challenge, and to do structured journalism, you, you pretty much need to build a separate CMS. Our, originally, at the St. Pete Times, we wanted to build PolitiFact in our existing CMS, and it was a real act of courage on the part of our senior editors to realize um, that that just wouldn't work and to let Matt build it separately in Django. and uh, and for our IT department to accept that. For, the, for a while, I thought that they were being brave, and then uh, somebody pulled me aside and said, no, uh, they were told that's what they were gonna do. So um, it was actually uh, less an act of bravery than it was um, just that the senior editor said that's what they had to do. And, and it worked out great. Um, we built a great CMS uh, that is scalable and that now works to power PolitiFact uh, not just at the national level, but to power uh, Pundit Fact and PolitiFact in eight other states. But uh, the CMS is, as, as always, a challenge, and you've got to build it right, and you have to have vision, you have to think about what your fields are going to be when you build the database, and you have to think about how you're going to scale it, and that's something that Matt did really well. Hmm? Miguel, what are the problems oh, that you We have a bunch of challenges, that are, but they're fun, they're fun uh, problems. Uh, one is that uh, since I'm a journalist, we did it as a package, as a CMS. 
and now we're realizing that the best way would have been and not in the CMS way. Uh, the reason for that is that we not we just didn't build it for ourselves, but we also open source it for other people to use it, and it was like a tank on bicycle pedals for some people, you know, like in. Like it was too big for some stories through some projects. And also people from different organizations wanted, let's say, a couple of pieces of Podopedia of or the platform and we weren't able to, to do. So now basically we're refactoring the whole thing or in the architecture so everything kind of like works as a standalone modules that you could uh, get together, you know, like Legos, they were saying yesterday, something like that. Um, also robots to feed the monster. You know, uh, uh, we've been working. Be I mean, I'm now in 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 working with the people in MIT and um, trying to get in with the, the people with the media cloud because we've already been doing that, you know, like, like fetching information. Okay, because let's say you're mapping any changes on Obama's life. Uh, if you set up a news feed, you're probably going to get 500,000 stories of naming Barack Obama every day which are the 20 that you need to read for you for your work you know like so defining uh, what is important there um, also algorithms we we want to we're working with a professor in chile uh, and i would love to speak to anybody who who is in the sphere is algorithms how do we measure power or influence uh, how do we have some sort of rank and also kind of show how it is, you know? It's not like cloud, you know? When you get 80 points in cloud and you're super something, but you don't know how they came to this thing. Well, we would like to have some sort of algorithm that, that provides that. And, and one just last thing that I want to throw as a challenge, because it's an open question, is um, linked data, uh, it's amazing, but it's also very complicated because it's structured. Uh, are there ways to be more fluid or adaptive of the things that are going on and while well, still using linked data? So, and, and I, I, I would sort of also just want to point out the cultural challenges that you face doing this because, you know, trying to get the rest of the newsroom to come along on these projects can be a long, difficult uh, challenge because uh, a lot of people don't see this as their job or they don't want to do it. It takes a lot of willpower to push something like this through and get uh, people done. Um, I think we've got people in the audience yeah, who Yeah, I'd, I'd like to throw it out at this point to um, two projects that have had a lot of attention for their structure, um, Circa and Vox. David and Melissa, would you guys be willing to step up and say a couple words? You, you can fight over it, that's yeah, okay. That's, that's okay too. <laughs> Actually, that's kind of a joke because um, I'm Melissa. I um, am the, one of the co-founders of Vox.com. And one of the things that I love about the work that you guys do and, and definitely some of the stuff that Circa does is that this is, this is a question that we're all sort of wrestling with together. Um, there, this isn't a fight, this is a, this, is a, this is a fight together because we need to figure out the um, rules and regulations of how the internet works. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we have some very clear ideas of what makes a great newspaper story, some very clear ideas of how a magazine story can look beautiful and deliver information. We know, um, we know what works well within a newscast, um, and we don't yet have all the answers online. Um, and I think that the, what you guys are exploring, um, what makes me so excited about this, is that we're in this space where we're trying to figure out the structure. Um, people can be incredibly creative when they have a structure. Sometimes when you have a blank page, um, you, you get kind of lost in, the, in sort of the openness of it all. Um, and, um, and so that's, that's sort of what I'm thinking about a lot, is how are we all coming together to sort of answer some of these fundamental questions about how we can make things work together. Something that Miguel mentioned was linked data. Um, and I think it's really interesting, you know, the, the web's been around for about 25 years, and we don't have um, one way to hyperlink together. There's different, there's, every person does it differently, every site does it differently. Some sites don't think that they should link out. Some sites, um, you know, they, there's, no, there's no real regulations on how to do this. So the more that we can come up with um, some structure even around the way that we use the web um, is really exciting to me. So. Now, uh, Melissa, if you don't mind, when we were speaking together a couple months ago, um, you spoke actually very specifically about linking and linking that didn't work particularly well on Vox. Would you mind talking about that a little bit? 
Yeah, I think that, um, I, I mean, I think that one of the things that we're building, we're building CMSs and we're building robots and we're building all these different pathways to help readers find the information they need. I think one of the things about the web is um, you have all of this stuff there. There's all of this, um, you, your you're, you have the ability to access so much information. Um, I was speaking to someone last night who was talking about the first days online when, and she um, scanned a Calvin and Hobbes book um, onto the internet. And it was like this like huge flash, like she can put a book online. What else can go online? Now everything is online. We have so much information online, but we don't have pathways to get there. And I think the link is like the fundamental um, component of that, that there's a, that there's, when you talk about walking down the Riverwalk or Michigan Avenue, you're building a roadway for readers, um, and links are one component of that. So I'm, I'm, I think about this a lot, like how, how, do we, how do we take our readers along a journey with us um, and, help, and help them see where they should be going? So that's kind of what I'm thinking about a lot. And I know you are too, because that's yeah. really what Circus is about. Yeah, I, I kind of I wish that I could like disagree vehemently with everything that's been said, but I, I can't. I mean, um, uh, I think, you know, the one thing that, um, and that I hope for is that there are, there are more players in this space, right? Cause, and, and this is sort of what you were just talking about. There's, I think, very few um, who are doing this um, really in a conscious effort. And, and, you know, Circa very much did take inspiration from Adrian Holovati and, you know, Chicago Crime Maps and, and PolitiFact as well. Um, and there's so much benefit to it. And I think our biggest challenge is thinking about how to take something like, when people talk about structured journalism, they immediately think about maps, because that was sort of the first sort of classic example. And in, data. And, right, right. Yeah. Um, and we're trying to think, well, how does that apply to narratives? How do you tell stories in a structured way? And I think the biggest challenge is, and this is the challenge for all of us who are thinking about this space, um, is how to get around the assumption of the article. Um, you know, and I often say at Circle, we don't write articles, we tell stories. And I, this is my international article symbol. Um, because it's sort of like this blob that we just shove information into and then it suffers all the things that Reg just talked about. And the, the reason why that's difficult is because it is such a baked in assumption um, to this industry, right? I mean, if you ask any average everyday reporter, well, what do you do? Um, they say, oh, I'm a journalist and I, I write articles, right? What am I going to do today? I'm going to write an article. Tomorrow I'm going to write an article. In a week, I'm pretty sure I'm going to write an article. Um, and, and that just suffers more, this problem of completely unstructured data. Um, so we need to find, I think, the, the right ways to evangelize um, as a group, um, which is why I'm glad there is now a group. Um, <laughs> you know, these ideas of, hey, um, what happens if you don't put your information and structure it I'll structure it as an article, but structure it in these ways, right? What happens when, you know, whether that's with Circa, um, again, telling a story, keeping track of what readers have, have read so that we can present information differently to them based on their context, as well as it, uh, selling it, I think we need to sell it, that's to the sell to readers. I think we also need to sell it to journalists. Um, one of the biggest selling points that I have found is what Miguel talked about of not having to repeat information, right? Our Ebola story is a year old. Um, so when we have new information, we don't have to re-explain yeah. what's been going on. We just, what's new right now. And this is actually where I think like Circa and Vox are playing in very similar space, but uh, it, we're, we're totally like, I think, colleagues in this because we're sort of on the, the breaking, you're sort of on the explanatory. Um, and I think we need to find more and more different examples of this, whether it be, yeah. you know, homicides or, you know, truth telling. You know, I imagine things of just quotes, right? I just want Obama quotes. Um, I just want, there was one called The Rookie, I think it was. It was all just quotes of sports players, and I thought it was brilliant. So, you know what's interesting? So, um, here we all are, and um, pretty much all new media organizations, Vox, Circa, now your legacy, I'm kind of legacy, you're new, you're new. Sure. Um, why hasn't the legacy media realized the value in this? I, I honestly just think it is that assumption of I mean, can you imagine going to a newsroom and saying, okay, everybody, um, don't write articles today. <laughs> um, instead, you're going to put in, I mean, like I'll use language from Circa, you're going to write atomic units <laughs> and then and thread those together. I mean, and Abraham uh, is a Circa contributor. Um, he's, he's right here. You can wait a pie. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's a, I, I think, I, I don't want to sound like I'm the new media guy and, you know, but I, I do think that there would be a lot of hair pulling 
um, and a lot of existential crisis around that. Um, and I don't think there should be. It's actually really liberating. Um, but that's what I imagine. There's, I think there's, there's, and we've discussed this, there are four problems, right? One is uh, newsroom culture. Um, you know, the editor in chief uh, usually has something more important he needs to do or something else. There's a CMS problem. There's the, uh, there's the product problem, which is that you don't actually have a product that does this, and so somebody on the business side doesn't get it. Uh, and then you've got the fundamental newsroom culture, you know, the, the average person culture problem, which, which gets in the way when you recruit from scratch. I think it makes a big difference. Yeah, I mean, Melissa? there's... Yeah, I, I, I obviously, I, I was working previously at a traditional newsroom at the Washington Post, and I, and I actually think that they are thinking about it. I mean, we, this, my first real talk about, um, about move, when I moved it sort of into the development side was around metadata. Um, but I, I, just, I mean, I do think, so I, so I think people are thinking about these questions, but it is a, it, you know, it's a, it's a, I think a lot of these organizations are very big. They have a lot of, they have to deliver on a product that is, um, Different from the product that is, you know, something that we can experiment on in smaller spaces. So I think it's a, le it's a, it's about teaching these lessons, and I think that we haven't fully figured out the, the answers ourselves. So it's difficult to teach to wide audiences, um, you know, when we're still trying to figure out the answers yeah. in some senses. Well, what we, what, uh, what strikes me uh, about it is that we, everybody who has Twitter here, who has a Facebook. And who has uh, a, a news feed? And, and the news feed is, is an update. Circat uh, is what it's doing is saying, hey, why are you going to write the story again if you already wrote it and the people are consuming, are you within the platform? Uh, we always keep forgetting that the way we make journalism has always been defined by technology. The fact that we invented the, the, the like this inverted pyramid, I don't know, you, you say it like that. Yeah, it might be about having a good storytelling way, but actually it has to do with uh, some guy was going to cut the cord of the telex, so you need to say, hey, they killed John Wayne, you know? <laughs> you know? There's, uh, so there's three people here um, who I, th I think are working on new projects or thinking about applying a new structure to existing projects. Um, Jennifer Brandel with Curious City. David Caswell has a new project called Structured Stories. Um, and Craig Silver, is Craig here? Craig was going to try and make it. He uh, has a project that he hasn't told me about yet, but said, hey, I'm doing structured journalism. Um, if you guys would share a little bit about how you're thinking about structure, um, what the problems that you're running into are, and you know, maybe how what you've heard here already is echoing true or false for you. Sure, um, I'm Jennifer Brandel. I founded uh, this project called Curious City. This is my editor, Sean. Ali, come on up, Sean. Um, so what we do, just real in a nutshell, is uh, we take our assignments from the public. They assign us uh, stories in the forms of questions, and then we actually physically go out and report with them. So it's local to the core. They come with us. They ask questions. And when they are asking us questions, we collect data on them. So we ask them what neighborhood they live in. We ask them uh, a few different questions that we have access to to find out where our users are coming from, what they're interested in. Then we also ask them to categorize uh, their questions. We're able to find out that the pattern that we're seeing are, don't match the verticals in our newsroom. Like just the organic things that people are telling us they're interested in don't actually match the things that us as an institution have decided are important for our audience. And Sean's thought a lot about this. Yeah, one of the things uh, we've been thinking through is that we do actually get a lot of questions that overlap. So for example, there's a deep tunnel system in Chicago that takes care of all of the sewage waste, right? And there's, there are new developments with this. We may have 15 different versions of, the, of questions about the deep tunnel system, but they're nuanced, right? And so as we take on some of these questions and try to satisfy this one person's curiosity about a piece of this, say, deep tunnel system, we have to keep revisiting reporting if we ever want to look at that again. Um, and so the worry that I have, I like the idea of structured journalism, but then we also um, worry a little bit is like, well, are we recreating an encyclopedia, for example? Are, are, you know, that's a kind and of what a, is the maintenance of that going to look like? Exactly. Yeah. And also, it's kind of a messed up encyclopedia because it's begun from you know, very random, seemingly random questions. So it's kind of, that's something that we're thinking through. Mm -hmm. David? I'm David Caswell. Uh, I have a project called Structured Stories, uh, and my, my background kind of coming to this is not from journalism. My, my background is in uh, knowledge engineering and data structures. And um, Structured Stories is, uh, if you look at a continuum, I guess, from, from uh, uh, the, the, the initial structured systems uh, from PolitiFact and Homicide Watch, 
and uh, and you know these are specific kind of domain specific uh, systems with with circa being a little further along towards a lot further along towards generalization i mean they're 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 atoms uh, or can be atoms of any story well my 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 uh, my technology i guess is is at the, at what i like to think of the extreme end of that spectrum um, and and what that means is is i'm i'm attempting and i think succeeding to to uh, structure all and any news events no matter how kind of random or unstructured they might be and there's several technologies that are enabling that to happen uh, kind of in a new way. One of them is linked open data, but there's several other uh, more core semantic technologies that let that happen. And this is kind of like one way to think of it is almost like a pidgin language for it describing news events. And then once I have these structured news events, I, I, uh, I, I assemble those into structured narratives, which have a, a level of complexity in their own right. It's not just a simple list of, of events. And then on top of that, those, those structured narratives uh, connect into a, a bigger whole, which I call a, a, a narrative network, or the stories interconnect on common characters, common events, common locations, and so on. Uh, so this this uh, this is a very kind of early stage thing. My my beta is launching in um, in a couple of weeks, and uh, the initial domain that I'm working with, and I'm just picking this domain because it's useful, is um, is is Los Angeles local city government, and and there's no sort of special reason. Uh, it's not restricted to that because of data structure. It's just I live in LA, and, and this is a nice sort of uh, easy domain to get my hands around. Um, and uh, that's kind of where it's at. I've, I've got a, a blog I keep about this uh, at structurestories.com, and, and the product itself will be available uh, in about two or three weeks. Um, and I, I think there's a lot of implications. I mean, in building this thing out, and sort of I've been at it for about a year and a half now, um, the, the, the sort of a, a deep realization about the journalism side is that uh, this, this does not, I mean, wh when people hear about the ability to structure all and any uh, uh, journalistic events, uh, it's initially sort of a little, a little scary from the, from the journalism side. But I actually don't think that, that that should be the case. I think there's this sort of layer of, uh, this meta-editorial layer, this meta-journalism <coughs> layer that goes on top of the structure uh, that's more important than ever. And, and I think uh, there's, um, th there's a lot of, of uh, uh, sort of core need for core journalistic values at that meta layer describing the structure and controlling and, and, and guiding the structure. David, I think you've really described a word that Reg and Bill and Chris and I kicked around early on, which was sort of like networked journalism, which goes back to <coughs> Melissa's point about linking. Yeah. Um, and, and that what we're doing is creating ecosystems within a network, and that is the structure. And, and I think this is incredibly important from the economics of journalism, because it is a way to rebundle journalism. And, and I think there's a lot of deep possibility economically there as well. And I have another concept that both of your projects, um, I think, do in their, even in their current forms. Um, Curious City, um, even not really structured yet, um, and structured stories with your demo that I saw yesterday, David, is that it puts the reader in charge, and I think that's what structured journalism is all about. Structured journalism puts the reader in charge, and it lets the reader create the content in the form they want. So if the reader says, I want to see uh, uh, all the young people who've been killed in homicides in Chicago, they can do that. If they want to see all the pants on fires uh, from people on the Fox News channel, if they have enough time, uh, they, can, uh, they can do that on Pundit Fact. Um, so, you know, I, I think structured journalism, you know, gives readers more power than they have if we do the filtering for them. I, and to just, I think, so that we don't get the wrong impression, we're not saying those great 8,000 word, you know, investigative pieces don't have a role. They obviously have a role. The point is that, you know, when you're doing, you can do that and this. In fact, they build on each other and they help people do both things, not one or the other. Yeah, I, uh, to that point I wanted to add earlier on that structure, the, the thing that makes structure difficult is that we have nesting dolls of structure. And your really basic inverted pyramid story that you learn to write in, in Journalism 101, that has a structure to it, right? Um, the really you know, basic story that you write for the web that links out to the story with more background, that has a really basic structure to it. I've been working really closely with a narrative editor at, at the Boston Globe recently, and he knows structure so intimately because he works on those 2,000 4,000, 6,000 word stories. And those stories have to have a structure to them in order for you to keep reading them and understanding them. 
And so that has a place in what we're talking about, too, and I think it's actually a very natural fit. Um, Did David Smedra make it in today? David, do you want to pop up? David's from Google, and I, I would love to bring in the, the tech perspective here to what we're talking about. Um, and he's part of our structured journalism uh, group, too. So if, if you join the group, you can hear more from him there, too. Uh, so I am from Google, but I was an English major twice over. So <laughs> I don't know how much tech background I can offer. Um, so I made this connection with the structured journalism crowd because I took a two-month fellowship at Neiman to study how could newsrooms express uh, future news events, things they know are going to happen, in a structured way. And I felt strongly that if they could ever do that um, and express in an XML feed or JSON or something, um, here are all of the events we know are going to happen. Not just a calendar, but really like the data skeleton underneath what could be a calendar, what could be a news app, what could be a section on their site, what could be a widget alongside articles and so on. They would have this engine that would fuel so many more experiences. I think the revenue point is a great point, that you know, there could be new business opportunities to come out of something like that. And it could just benefit readers more and users could understand more about the news they are consuming. So that was the project I started with. Um, and it was entirely separate from anything I do at Google. I got to play in the sandbox for two months and now I'm back at work. Um, <coughs> but I think the problem I ran into, and that is interesting to, and I think we're all kind of circling it, is the problem I ran into is, was I building a data format? Was I building a product? Should this be a tool? Should this be something that's like internally facing for newsrooms or something that the broader community of users would, would, would adopt? And the answer is none of those. The answer is we need an ecosystem first to work on all of those things together mm -hmm. and assist all of these efforts. And mm -hmm. so uh, being at Google for about six years, being in journalism for about 10, I think a lot of, a lot of conversations from 10 years ago around looking at online news and all the hand wringing around, what should online news look like? Um, and knowing that the article would just, was not up to snuff anymore as a format or a unit, this is it. This, I really believe, if we can keep making progress with how to structure the, 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 the news atoms that we have and how to express them in different ways and then send them out, it's really incremental effort for exponential benefit. So we'll be looking forward to that funding from Google. <laughs> uh, maybe we should... Right, right after uh, 17 minutes away when the panel ends. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. we should probably sort of start opening up the questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, in, in point of that, I bet that starting October, you know, people are start asking Google, where can I get a custom for Halloween? Uh, when the spring starts or the school starts, we have a bunch of episodes that repeat every every time in the year and, and we could actually kind of like calendar for it and we also keep forgetting sometimes because we're journalists that actually we need to answer questions to the people that are our readers you know uh, so we used to say that the news were when uh, when a man bit a dog but now it's when the dog bit me bit my friend because I know my friend is important so there's a bunch of things that we don't do but other people do and answer you know like transportation apps that's pretty newsworthy for me if I want to get to ONA for example um, so there's a, a lot of things to about thinking about that people are going to internet to ask questions and get solutions and there's a bunch of information that is really important for somebody like people open data Regular people don't know about open data or what it, it's called open data. I just want to get that certificate so I can get a, a, a like I can get a, a government fund for what I need or 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 this some yeah. things like that. It, it really is about what the mission is. So the, it, I hope there's questions, but if there are, please come up. Uh, hi, my name is Jeannie Pinder. I'm the founder and CEO of ClearHealthCosts.com bringing transparency to the healthcare marketplace by telling people what stuff costs. Yeah. I wanted to shout out to David who helped me out when we really didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> and to Chris who insisted that I come. Um, and to say thank you because I feel like I found my people. So um, we just built <clears throat> for a night funding for our partners at KQED and KPCC Public Radio in Los Angeles something that we could call a C-click fix for healthcare pricing. Mm -hmm. And we launched it like um, two and a half months ago and since then <clears throat> we've had hundreds of shares, thousands of searches, 
We've been asked to write about it for the New England Journal of Medicine, oh. uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association. We were cited publicly in a contract dispute between Stanford Health and Anthem Blue Cross. So we're feeling pretty great about it. But I think that legacy newsrooms do want to do this. They just don't know how. And to give them the plug and play tool like what we've given them, <clears throat> We've heard a lot of interest from other potential partners in response to our prototype who say, you know, this is high value information for our communities. The responses that we got from our community members were amazing. And um, I think you guys are in the right place at the right time, and I'm happy to join up. Jean, so. I, I love the idea of C-click fix, and it's something that I've yeah. thought a lot about for Homicide Watch, too, about how yeah. um, a structured, it has to be structured, how a structured open platform right would work for community news gathering and engagement right. and how that changes how the story is told and how people tell the story themselves within these structures that are, are predefined in, in terms of telling people what needs to happen in, in order for the story to be told in the way that they want it to be told. Right. And about something that they really care about. Like not everybody cares about health care pricing, just like not everybody cares about Ebola or whatever, but when they care about it, they really care and they tell us the most amazing things. Like, we heard from people when we started out doing this that nobody was going to want to share their personal health information, that we were, um, it was like pushing a big rock uphill, that we would fail, but people love it. And we've been really excited. We've been able to do some good journalism around it, in addition to having a database that people can use and go and shop for their MRI, their IUD. So it's a different kind of journalism. Well, may right maybe here. next ONA we'll bring T-shirts for our people to wear. <laughs> we'll bring one for you. Can you say the name of, of, your, of your group again and the tool? Uh, the group is clearhealthcosts.com. The actual tool uh, does not reside on our website because we ran out of money and because the um, CSS and our custom WordPress theme fights with the CSS and the widget. <laughs> Who okay. would have thought? A CMS yeah. problem. Yeah, yeah. But, but the, the actual widget is fully plug and play. And we can drop it into anybody who doesn't have a custom WordPress theme. Cool. So, Amazing. Amazing tagline, by the way. See, click, fix for healthcare plans or something okay. like that. Thank right? you. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Walter Frick. I'm with Harvard Business Review. Uh, I would love to hear the panel's thoughts on the idea, you know, we've talked about maybe the article isn't the right uh, unit and sort of some of these efforts are experimenting on that. Um, but I would love to hear your thoughts on distribution, because if distribution has sort of a, a classic way that we do it, especially on social media, it's about what's new. Um, and in some of these experiments, we are sort of thinking about the user coming to something and finding what they're looking for. How do you think about the distribution, how that actually kind of gets out to the reader in a social and mobile world? Sure. I think about um, really, really deeply engaged readers. That's what we deal with on Homicide Watch. Um, on the DC site, which there are four Homicide Watch sites, DC, Chicago, Trent, New Jersey, and Boston. Um, Sun-Times runs it in Chicago, Northeastern University in Boston, and the Trentonian in Trenton. Um, the DC site itself sees half a million page views a month, which isn't a lot for most news organizations, but when you have one full-time reporter, half a million page views is, is pretty darn good. Um, we see something like five to seven pages per visit, sometimes higher, depending on what's happening. So, you know, that, that type of engagement is what we really look for in the structure, that the structure is creating pathways for people to hit those high number of page views, that high time on site um, within our users. I think PolitiFact does more in uniques than, than we do, and, and we're sort of on opposite ends of the spectrum there. Yeah, and PolitiFact's, um uh, strategy for distribution has been more traditional using legacy media so you know uh, go on CNN in the morning to talk about the newest fact checks go on a morning edition all things considered we had partnerships with NPR during the campaign um, and then publish not just on the site but also in print partners we did print syndication so uh, the Chicago Tribune, Indianapolis Star would buy uh, the right to publish our content in print. And so we had sort of a back to the future <coughs> strategy was, you know, publish on the web, but also sell it in print and make it available to broadcast partners. In our case, um, um, 
we do partnerships with uh, with uh, newsrooms, and we try to frame it as that we're a me we're a, we're not a news website, but we're really kind of like a meta news website. So we don't we don't try to compete with them. We just try to complement what they have, and they actually we we're Creative Commons 3.0. Like you can commercialize, you can use it for almost anything for free. Um, uh, so we get a lot of newsrooms to that republish content or take some parts of it and, and, and use it for, for special projects. Um, and we rely heavily on, 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 uh, on uh, social media, especially Twitter. I mean, we're fortunate enough to have in our board people that have one guy has 800,000 users, uh, I mean followers in Twitter. Uh, so we use it a lot to, uh, to, to promote and the same thing in, in Facebook. Um, and the good thing is that our goal is to be, if, if you ask something about somebody that is from Chile or from Colombia or Venezuela, our goal is to be in the, re in the search results above, uh, above Wikipedia. You know, like, or be the second underneath Wikipedia. I, uh, I, I want to just take that and turn that question around because you talk about distribution to get things out. I'm, you know, I, 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 I half live in the nonprofit world and most of the rest of the time I'm just a, you know, nasty um, for profit uh, journalist. And the, the, the notion is to sort of get around, I think Jeff Bezos was the one who said something about the, the sort of the aggregation problem. I do want stories to get out, I do want information to get out, but I, want, but I don't want it to be easily taken away from me. And so part of the reason for these sites, for the way Connected China was built, was that it's the experience. You can take the information, but you can't take the experience, and that's what forces people to come to us. And that would, in theory, whether they be uh, you know, subscriptions or whatever it is, I need the people to come in. And in Connected China, when we launched it, we had 20 minutes on site average viewer for a while, and that was you know, pretty damn Good. Um, hi, my name is uh, John Greenman. I'm from the University of Georgia. Um, one of the questions throughout has been what's the difference between sort of traditional journalism and this stuff. And I was wondering if I could get uh, either Laura or Chris to talk about something that they had said a couple of years ago at a Neiman encounter. Uh -oh. <laughs> that, no, no, <laughs> that if you take the U-shaped curve, what journalists historically do is write about outliers, and that what you guys do is gather all the information and then let people decide what they think the news is. Sure. And that, that sort of difference between the outliers and gathering everything. Sure. Um, I've told this story several times, so I'll tell it just briefly. Before Homicide Watch started, I met with um, an editor in DC with this crazy idea that I had to cover every homicide. And, um, and the editor said, well, why would you do that? They're all just drug deals gone bad. Um, which told me a lot about the news, news judgment of um, that editor and covering crime. Um, I knew from just reading you know, some brief information from the police department and, and going to court and reading some court records that that wasn't the case. And that's when it really dawned on me um, how important that promise to 100% was um, if we could do it because I, I didn't trust his gut, I didn't trust my gut, and I didn't really trust anyone's gut. And so in order to make sure that that curve that we were using, that the cases that we were putting on either side of it really belonged there for what was usual and, and what was unusual, we needed to know for sure. And, and that's where the structure came in. Um, once we did that, and as Homicide Watch uh, began rolling along and people started reading it, um, those very early theories that I had were confirmed. Um, they also showed me that the cases that were traditionally um, treated as newsworthy by most media, um, particularly in DC, were not necessarily, if ever, the cases that drew the most attention and traffic to Homicide Watch that there were great communities um, around stories that were, in many respects, fairly typical. Um, and that those were communities that needed the storytelling, that needed the reporting, that wanted to engage with it and be part of our community around it more than any other. Um, and so that's where we, we really found um, our place in that deep center of the U um, with the acknowledgement that 
that center of the U changed and shifted depending on the day and that we had created something that changed and shifted along with it. And if I can add something to that, what I think is great about that is that there are times when journalists and when journalism ought to be about something more than clicks. And so, yeah, they covered a homicide that not that many people clicked on. Great. And in the greater totality of reporting the story of homicides in DC, that's important. And in the same way that uh, you know, we all do stories that are important, um, you know, we can't always be driven by clicks. And so I think that's great. And um, I, you know, I, I, sometimes I think that you know, gets lost a little bit. So we probably, we're going to run out of time pretty soon. So let's take the question. And then I think as we answer, why don't we get in a final thought as well? Hi, my name is Markham Nolan. I'm from vocative.com. Um, I love the idea of structured journalism as a, as a way of building newsroom memory in a way. So you're, you're creating a structure by which you can then go back and make, make sense of current events through what's in the past. I'm curious if anyone on the panel, perhaps David from Circa, as you're building your structures, do you build in either metadata or, or any other kind of data points speculatively, not having any idea how they might work in the future, um, just in case something crops up and at a later date this actually becomes a salient point or, or column or something you can filter for and, and make sense with? I think Connected China and Polar API are the best for yeah. that. Um. Well, the, 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 the cool part of, you know, giving it structure and not letting a journalist define if the subject is air or, or environment uh, allows you precisely to, to express connections. I mean, one of the things that is important is that the machines, but also we can understand that a President Obama is from Chicago, lived in this neighborhood, and went to this high school, and his daughters went to this high school, which is a kind of like elite high school I've learned in, in the past days. Uh, so basically, what you're doing is saying that A is connected to B through C, etc., and all those connections are, are marked down, you know, like are annotated. Uh, and the cool part of it is that if you hand in the data to, uh, to uh, um, a scientific, for example, he'll, under, he'll discover things. For example, we had a, a professor that did a paper uh, with our data, and he was amazing because he kind of like understood from where the people came from, and the good part of this is that it generates inferences. You know, like well, if A is connected to C and B is connected to C, then A and B are connected through C, and you start seeing. So as much data you have, it's better, and it's a good business. I mean, Palantir is a good example about that, uh, or you know, or what Google does about metadata. Uh, but yes, the answer is like you can get metadata on it in, in a pretty cool way. And you can call it in several other ways, too. You want to get a quick last word out of everyone? Because I think we're going to run out of time in a sec. So uh, I just want to encourage anybody who's interested in this to sign up for our Google group. Um, and it's right there. And it's a nice short URL. <laughs> um, uh, we probably should have done a, done a tiny URL for that. but. Um, we, uh, uh, we have a mailing list that we, we send to occasionally and uh, have some uh, interesting conversations going. So I uh, hope you'll do that and watch us on, uh, on the Duke Reporters Lab website, which I'm redoing. We're going to have a structured journalism area. Uh, and that's in addition to Reg's wonderful blog, which has been really the place for great discussion of this. And that site's there, too. And, so sign up and follow along and let us know if you're doing anything in this area because uh, I just think it shows great promise and it's really coming into its own. Laura? Yeah, I, I will add that we do have a collaborative Google spreadsheet um, that is open to anyone and everyone to add projects that they're working on, that they've heard of, that they think fits within this sphere of structured journalism too. We're working really hard to build a vocabulary around this because while the ideas seem very simple, um, what I've found is that we really lack the words um, to communicate with one another about why this works, why it doesn't, what our problems are, and how we would like to see it work in the future. Um, that's really step one here, and that's the conversation that we're hoping to jumpstart today. Um, now that everyone has, has come together and we've heard from so many great projects, including um, 
Structured Stories, Circa, Vox, Curious City, um, so many others. And, and I know that there are so many of you in the room here today with projects that you're sitting here thinking that it fits into what we do here. Um, we wish that we could have had time to hear from you as well, and we hope to hear from you on the Google group and on the spreadsheet, because the more of these projects we can bring together, the more we can talk about them together, I think and hope the more we can really improve um, how these projects are thought of and, and talked about throughout the news industry and our communities as well, and that's, that's why we're here today. Miguel, you have some thoughts? Yeah, um, following that, it'd be amazing, like we have guidelines for graphs, for example, in charts, to kind of like have some guidelines for what linked data would be for, or or structures, or or how we call information to structure projects. Kind of like share more of, of what we what we all learn because this is, some of these issues are very 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 hard. And the second thing is that I would like to kind of like see more projects asking how can we tell the same story in seven different ways. Like how can I tell a investigative piece? in a cell phone, you know, like in, 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 in Circa, because structure, like McLuhan finally was like vindicated, uh, defines narrative or the narrative structure, you know, and, and context defines the platform we're gonna use, and people are platform promiscuous. So we should be thinking like in which platform we're gonna tell the story, which way we're gonna tell it for that right context, and and also, I mean, we try to target millennials and when we do like investigative pieces, for example, we never bother to do a summary for somebody to, like was too busy at the moment to read the whole thing, could like read the summary, here's, here's what it comes down to, so you can read it and, and comment it with other people that are interested about it. And <laughs> afterwards, you may or may not write, read the whole thing, but the point is to kind of like be more empathetic or, of the way people are consuming news now. So I think actually those are great points about how information goes to people differently. We obviously can't write 15 versions of every story to everyone and everyone's got a different take on it. Maybe the, maybe the new way to talk about this is responsive design for stories um, because it's responsive to people. Anyway, the, I think thank you all for coming. I really do think this is an important thing and, and I do believe that Obviously, a lot of other people are going to work on this sort of things. A lot of people are taking apart our stories already and, and re-aggregating them and, and putting them back together and more power to all the people that do all that. But I think most of us got into this business for a reason, which is you know, there is a public service element. There is a mission. Um, I think we can do much better on our mission if we, if we really take to heart the ideas of what readers really want and what we can give them um, as well as what they need. Um, so thank you very much, and uh, we hope you'll go out there, join the group, and do much more of this kind of stuff. So thank you all. Thank you.